Salve a tutti amici di Comics Reporter, Fumetto Mania e... The Flywall Show. Oggi abbiamo un ospite veramente molto ma molto amato dal pubblico italiano. Lo ricordiamo tantissimo per la sua run su Amazing Spider-Man, pubblicato in Italia per la prima volta dalla Star Comics. Ricordiamo la sua serie, sempre insieme a Tom DeFalco, di Thor Thunderstrike. È stato co-creatore insieme a Tom DeFalco e a Salbusce, ma anche del personaggio di Spider-Girl. Welcome, Ron. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Perfetto, allora cominciamo con la prima domanda, sempre cominciamo con le domande che vengono poste dal pubblico. La prima domanda ce la fa Andrea Stefano Gagna e ci dice come nacque l'idea di realizzare una storia particolare come il ragazzo che collezionava l'uomo ragno su Amazing Spider-Man 248, una storia drammatica e fuori dai canoni per quegli anni. Racconta. Only that, let's see, Roger Stern, the writer, told me that he dreamed that story. He woke up one morning and he had dreamed that story. And he spent the next several days asking around if if, if he had read it somewhere, like maybe it was an old Superman story he had read as a kid or something like that. And he asked around and he asked around and everybody he talked to said, no, that sounds like it's original idea. So he sat down and he scripted it, but because it was short, It, he figured it would run maybe in an annual or as, you know, as something like that, some kind of backup in an annual. But then uh, Assistant Editor's Month came along and they decided that they were going to run it in Assistant Editor's Month. And uh, I was chosen, I don't know why. They kind of flipped the coin because John Romita Jr. was the regular artist and they had the one story that was part of continuity with the villain Thunderball that they were going to bring in. Uh, to wrap up that storyline. So they decided, the editors decided at that point to let John Romita Jr. finish the story he had started and, al- and allow me to do The Kid Who Collects Spider-Man. Uh, when I read the script uh, and the plot, I knew my job was just to stay out of the way, to just don't screw it up because it was a beautiful, beautiful story. But it was all laid out as far as what Roger wanted, as far as the newspaper sections that are run during the course of it and everything so the emotion was all very much on the page and uh and i decided to homage steve ditko because spider-man really wasn't doing anything spider-man-y in it he wasn't acting out he was there wasn't a lot of action in it so i needed spider-man to be spider-man just standing there And I didn't want him to just be the human figure standing there in a Spider-Man costume. I wanted people to look at him and say, oh, that's Spider-Man standing there. And I felt the best way to do that was to study Ditko, uh, in particular, older, uh, earlier Ditko, to get some of that nuance and some of the stance and everything that was, that was very specifically Spider-Man. And uh, it it actually concerned a few people early on. Uh, This was all pre-Todd McFarlane. So everything was very much the Ramita standard at that point, which I have no problem with. So there was some consternation as far as me doing the Ditko webbing, the reverse webbing and not worrying about the web patterns as much. And there was some talk about having the anchor correct it, fix it, you know. Uh, But to their credit, they decided to go ahead and and let it go through the way it did. And I, and it, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story. It's a charming story. All these years later, it's still something I'm very, very proud to have been a part of. And I feel very fortunate to have been uh, given the opportunity. And apparently I didn't screw it up, but quite frankly, anybody could have drawn that story. And unless they screwed it up, it would have been as wonderful and charming and heartwarming and touching as as it was, because it all was on the page from, from Roger Stern. Benissimo. Una storia realmente molto amata e apprezzata da tutto il pubblico. Andiamo avanti con le domande dal pubblico. Questa volta è il turno della domanda che ci viene posta da Crisis in Comics e ci chiede parlaci del tuo rapporto con l'editor e scrittore Tom De Falco che, ricordiamo al pubblico, abbiamo avuto l'onore e il piacere di poter intervistare precedentemente. Tom DeFalco and I are, at this point, about as close as you can get to family. <laughs> I mean, I, I consider him a brother. 
Uh, and one of the reasons for that is from the time he first, I first met him as an editor and he was my editor on Marvel Team Up, um, he, has, he has a lot of the teacher in him um, and he will discuss things with you and give you insight into his thinking. He's not, he's very much not a boss. He's, it, it's not do it this way because I say so. It's this may, may work better because of this, you know, be, because of his experience. And he will inform you and teach you about that experience and why certain things work and why certain things don't. He also believes that if you're working with somebody as a writer, you're a fool not to take ideas from everywhere if you're trying to write a monthly comic. So when we were hired together on Spider-Man, we spent hours and hours on the phone discussing who Peter Parker was. And in the course of that, you know, you're also talking about your real life and everything. And, and uh, you realize what a terrific person you're, you're collaborating with. And uh, yeah, I mean, he's so, so he's very collaborative. He's very open to suggestion. He, I've never, ever heard him say, because I said so, you know, as far as uh, being jealous of his position as an editor or a writer, he will always explain his reasoning to you. And you can't help but appreciate that and respect that and learn from it. And uh, I've learned a lot from working with Tom and from having Tom as a friend. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's a terrific guy. I can't say enough good things about him. I'm sure you, you've already interviewed him, haven't you? So you yeah. know he's a terrific guy. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's the best. He really is. I, I look forward to at some point working with him again. I, I really hope so. But even if we don't, we talk every couple of weeks and we uh, you know, discuss life and <laughs> what's going on in politics and all that kind of stuff. So yes, uh, he's, he's very much family. Grazie per la tua risposta. Mario, te la parola per qualche domanda al nostro ospite. Certo, assolut assolutamente. Ron, tu hai avuto la possibilità di lavorare a un design come quello del costume nero di Spider-Man, che fondamentalmente significava modificare uno dei costumi più iconici della storia dei comic book americani e crearne un altro che poi sarebbe diventato altrettanto iconico. Eh, vuoi raccontarci qualcosa a proposito di, questa, di, questo, di questo particolare evento? I really, I didn't design the suit. Um, it, the suit was designed by Mr. Mike Zeck, who was the artist on Secret Wars. And uh, there, it was slightly modified by Mr. Rick Leonardi, who was an artist that handled it around the same time I was first handling it. He made slight little, he, he suggested a slight second break in the legs to kind of make it look more organic, more like a spider. But I was sent the original sketches Uh, as the artist who was going to be drawing that issue. And I thought it was a new villain. I, I had no idea they were changing the costume. And what's important to remember is that this was the first time something like that had been done. And it was before the internet and it was before, you know, uh, email and everything else. So we didn't know how it was going to go over. And the initial announcement that Spider-Man was going to get a new costume did not go over well at all in the fan press. We started getting letters saying that we were idiots for changing the best costume that ever existed, which is absolutely true because it is the best costume ever designed. Mr. Ditko is unsurpassed at that. That is one of the best costumes ever. Indeed. So, uh, there was absolutely, nobody thought there was a need for it other than Jim Shooter wanted something that would, without a doubt, show that the Secret Wars was having this incredible impact on all these characters, you know, and Spider-Man showing up with a completely new look was certainly something to signal that Secret Wars was a big deal. So I, again, I thought it was a villain. I was told that, you know, I, I waited <laughs> all the, my entire life up to that point. I was, I guess, like 24, 25. I had wanted to draw Spider-Man since I was six. And when I finally got a chance to draw Spider-Man, he's in a new suit, you know? So, so I was, you know, I mean, I thought it was gorgeous. I mean, I, I thought it was a nice design, but you know, I wanted to draw Spider-Man and the fans weren't crazy about it. So 
the one, the one story that I don't know whether Mr. Defalco told you the story, but uh, we were getting such negative mail about the black suit that Jim Shooter, the editor in chief at the time, who started the whole thing, he came in and he said, what issue are you introducing the black suit? And Tom said, 252. And he said, get rid of it in 253. We're dying. You know, the mail is all negative. Nobody wants to deal with this. And he goes, well, we can't do that, though, Jim, because the, the, the suit isn't introduced until like issue seven, I believe, of Secret Wars, seven or eight. Yeah. And he said, so we can't get rid of it in Spider-Man before it's introduced in that issue of Secret Wars, which is just pure logic and storytelling. And Jim Shooter had to agree with that. So we kept the suit. If you do, if you watch the way the issues were uh, uh, released, the month after it appears in Secret Wars, is introduced in Secret Wars, is the issue that we get rid of it in The Amazing Spider-Man. And, but by that time with snail mail, with regular postage mail, we were starting to get positive mail because everybody actually liked the suit once they saw it. Once they saw it, everybody loved it, but we were already on track to tell the story about how Pete gets rid of it which is why we then did the stories where the black cat made a cloth version and he was switching back and forth between the red and blue and the black and on and on and on. And then ultimately it becoming Venom. But yeah, it was, it was a very different, it wasn't a cynical change. It, you know, a lot of people think about what we did back then in the context of what has happened since and you know that it's happened to Superman and it's happened to a bunch of other characters. You know, we, they, they mess with the look all the time. But this was the first time something like that had been attempted with a mainstream character. And uh, mostly everybody was frightened by it until it proved to be a success. Because it was, uh, it, it would not have been, if it wouldn't have been a success, it wouldn't have been something you wanted to be, you know, um, uh, associated with. So, um, I'm very relieved that it was a hit. Do you think that the, the toys companies producing the action figure had some impact in deciding to, to change that costume and also since every time that was a, a decision of marketing to have more action figures to, to modify uh, costumes in the comic book character? I think, that's, I think that's what it has become, yes. I, I mean, in the, yeah, in the films especially, uh, they, they adjust the costumes every film so that they can remarket new action figures. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even at the time, I think Jim Shooter was probably forward thinking in that if one of the things that happens during Secret Wars is that Spider-Man gets a new suit, then you get two Spider-Man action figures instead of one. Of course. That kind of thing. So, uh, but, but I, it has become something that you know, everybody kind of looks at it much more cynically these days that, you know, yeah. any kind of major change, like the death of a character, well, you know, he's going to come back or, or a major costume change or even a power change like we did on Superman, you know, uh, you know, where the audience is told, oh my gosh, this is huge and this is never going to change back. And of course, <laughs> nobody believes that anymore because they've been fooled too many times. Yeah. Indeed. Perfetto, perfetto. Allora Mario, facciamo anche un'altra domanda uh, riguardo un altro personaggio co-creato insieme a Tonde Falco e a Salbuscema. Qua abbiamo... Ovviamente. Oh, wow. Qu questa, questa settimana, I vote this week. Terrific. That's fantastic. Thank you. Forza. Ron, tu hai avuto la possibilità di lavorare a un altro personaggio della famiglia di Spider-Man che è Mayday Parker. Eh, puoi raccontarci qualcosa della creazione di quel character così particolare? Sure, uh, it was all Tom's fault. It was all Tom DeFocco's fault. He, uh, he had this idea that he had wanted to play with for years uh, because he was working on the Spider-Man books without me, unfortunately. Uh, when the baby was conceived and when the pregnancy was happening. So he let his mind wander to if the baby were born safely and everything that, that he had this story that he wanted to tell. Uh, luckily, he came to me and said, are you interested in maybe working on this with me for this one issue of what if? 
And I said, that sounds like a lot of fun. And I'll work with Tom on anything. I, he's a joy to work with. And even though he had a general story idea, again, he welcomed me in to help with the plotting. And, and uh, we decided very early on that we wanted it to, to read like a pilot for a new series, because that's the only way to, to create something like this. You want to create something as if you're going to have to tell stories about this character forever. You know, you want to make sure that the character has solid motivation and its supporting cast serves to tell you something about the character. And, you know, Tom and I had long discussions and, and that's when we came up with the idea that, that May Day was a complete combination of Mary Jane and Pete, that she was so popular. She was friends with the geeks and the jocks and that she always felt divided, like she had to choose between the two. But when she discovers her legacy, when she discovers that, that Peter Parker was Spider-Man, um, for the first time as Spider-Girl, she's using her physicality and her intelligence together. And, and it's a wonderful feeling for her to finally feel complete. And when we got into all of that, when we found our hook, we really did feel like we had something special, and uh, for us, it was it was almost what we did in our in our minds. What we did is, you know, when we left Spider Man back in the uh, in the eighties, they canceled the book. You know, the, the the show was canceled. Nobody's been doing Spider Man stories, and all these years later, we're coming back to check in with the cast. You know, we're we're, we're we brought the actors back together, and we have everybody back together. And we're talking about what's happened in the last 16 years. And it was great fun for us, loving the characters as much as we do. And uh, I think we successfully were able to tell a story because of our love of the characters. I think we were able to tell a story that readers wanted to see more of. And you can't do better than that. I mean, as a, as a creator, to you know have people say, we want more <laughs> is the best thing in the world. You know? <laughs> So uh, I think she's a terrific character. Um, I love working on her whenever I can, uh, whenever we're asked. Uh, I think that's the one character that no matter how retired Tom DeFalco ever becomes, I think some of those characters that he's co-created are the characters that could bring him back. You know, Spider-Girl could pull him out of retirement. I think Thunderstrike could probably pull him out of retirement. You know, the characters that, that, that he co-created that he has a real love of, you know. Uh, I, I think, you know, you could probably coax him out of retirement with any of those characters. But, uh, but yeah, I think our love for the characters was on the page and uh, people re responded really well to it. So. Benissimo. A proposito di Thor Thunderstrike, ritorniamo alle domande che ci vengono proposte dal pubblico. Questa volta è quella di Michael Lagoki che ci chiede I tuoi personaggi legati al mondo di Thor hanno una forte possenza, un'importante massa muscolare. Cosa li diversifica dagli altri personaggi che hai creato? Uh, it, was, it was a transition. Um, you know, it, it, it was a real thing to deal with. Whether I was expecting it or not, I don't remember at the time. Because Spider-Man is a very personal character. And if you look at the way uh, Steve Ditko would tell the stories, he would do like nine panel pages, you know, nine panels on a page. And it's very intimate storytelling. It's very human storytelling. And it, it, it's kind of like the difference between doing a very intimate play or a very intimate television series, and then going big budget movies. Because when you go to Thor, you're widescreen and big budget, big action. And what helped me adjust was the same thing that Tom DeFalco did to help himself adjust. Because initially we didn't really, we weren't looking to do Thor. Uh, we were hoping to do Daredevil out of the same editor's office. Ralph Macchio was the editor. And uh, Tom heard that he needed a new team on Daredevil. So he went in and said, Ron and I would like to do Daredevil. In the meantime, he asked us to do two Thor fill-ins, the, uh, the Secret Wars backstory and the future Thor story that we did. 
And then after we completed those, we thought maybe we were going to start on Daredevil, but he goes, actually, I'd love you to do Thor for me. And Tom didn't feel he could do Thor. He didn't feel he could do Cosmic. He enjoys street level characters, kind of like Ben Grimm, the thing from the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and characters like that. So he decided if he was going to try to do Cosmic, if he was going to try to do Thor, he was going to jump in on the deep end. And we did that celestial story uh, very early in our run. And that served the same purpose for me as it did for Tom in that you realized you needed to tell a Thor story differently than you would tell a Spider-Man story. You know, you needed to use bigger panels and, and broader action. And yes, all the characters had to become, you know, godlike instead of incredibly human. You needed to make them godlike. And, uh, and there was, yeah, there was a lot of adjustment to, uh, to making the characters bigger. If, <laughs> I, hate, I hate to give people ammunition against me, but if you look at my early Thor stories, sometimes the heads are very, very tiny on the bodies because I was concentrating so much on trying to make the characters bigger and grander and more muscular than Spider-Man that yeah. I sometimes lost track and the heads would look very, very tiny on giant bodies until I adjusted a little bit, you know? And interestingly, uh, Patrick Olive, who's another terrific illustrator, I used to share studio space with him. He went from doing untold tales of Spider-Man to doing some Thor stories for us. And he went through the same transition with the tiny little heads, except that because I was there, we, we noticed it sooner. So his, his period didn't last as long. But yeah, there is this weird adjustment between the intimacy of uh, and the humanity of a Spider-Man story and the, the grandness and the big budget epicness of a, of a Thor story. Yes, there definitely is a difference and it is a transition that you have to be aware of. So the, the, the question is terrific. I mean, I, not too many people would, uh, would realize that. Ron, tu sei stato il protagonista del rilancio del fumetto in Italia. Il, il tuo uomo ragno ehm, segna la Silver Age italiana, eh, pubblicato alla Star Comics. Lo ricordiamo con tanto affetto e con tanto veramente amore, quello, quello il tuo uomo ragno, così si dice in Italia. Ehm, ovviamente, facciamo una domanda un po' tecnica. Mm, Come è cambiato il modo di far fumetto? dal punto di vista tecnico rispetto agli anni Ottanta, ovviamente sappiamo che siamo passati dal, dal manuale al digitale. I am not using digital. Uh, I am 61 years old. I got into this business because it was, even at the time I got into it, uh, 30 some years ago, it was one of the last bastions of being able to draw with a pencil and a piece of blank board and just creating that way. And it's one of the reasons why I loved it so much uh, because computers were just starting to come in as I was getting out of art school. And, uh, but, but I, I, what I loved about it was that I could draw in pencil and I could collaborate with all these other people that would take care of the, the coloring and the inking and, and the publishing and all this. Uh, so I'm very much an old school penciler. Um, I, 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 there are people, I do know people who are using digital and the best, the best of them are using it as a new tool. And at best, that's what it is. I mean, the talent, the creativity and the talent still has to be there, the craft still has to be there. And the computer is just another tool to, to, to come up with your, your uh, final uh, form, your final illustration. But uh, I myself, no, I, the most I do is I scan, I scan things and send them. And occasionally, you know, the, the inkers now often are working off of a scan. They just, they produce it, they print it out as a blue line, uh, non, uh, non reproducible blue line, and they just ink it off of that. So there are, there, I've done a few jobs where I get to hold on to the pencils because all they need is the scan, you know, that kind of thing. And even that's kind of bizarre for me. I, working with Sal Buscema up to the very end of uh, Spider-Girl and even the work we're doing with sitcomics, 
um, working with Sal, I was still sending him the boards uh, through, you know, overnight delivery, FedEx and things like that. And I would send him the boards and he inks right on the boards and the pub, the pub, the boards go to the publisher and all that kind of stuff. So we're still working that way. I, I'm not, I haven't gotten to a point with any publisher where I'm, uh, we've really changed that old standard way of working yet. It could happen. And if it does, I'll deal with it as best I can as a 61 year old man. But, uh, so far, I'm still, it's just me and a pencil and a blank piece of board. So, I, I appreciate this because in the end, uh, when you're drawing, uh, you, you have the, the panel, so you can go back to the panel, see how they, they get told with you. You, you can see uh, uh, your history. Otherwise, you just get a file in the, your PC. Oh. Is it something more cold? Oh, yeah. The, the, I mean, that, the working uh, with the computers, I mean, now with these NFTs and things, yeah. maybe it'll change, but yeah, the, 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 the complete lack of original art, uh, physical art is a shame. I mean, not just for the collector market, but just for the fact that it doesn't exist in real life except as a print. You know, yeah, it's, that, that's a very weird, you know, I've been doing some reading on NFTs and I'm not sure I still completely understand it. Uh, but uh, conceptually, I, I think I, I'm getting a handle on it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I see, I felt bad when we started doing computer lettering because I used to always love to see the boards with the lettering right on the board so that anytime you had original art, you didn't just have art, you had a scene from the book with all the lettering and the characters interacting and the people, you know, the, the, the dialogue and everything. So, you know, it's, it's been a slow conversion over to this period now where there's there's no physical art and it's it's yeah. very bizarre it's very very bizarre yes yeah of course Benissimo, allora sì, apprezziamo tantissimo i tuoi sketch eh, che pubblichi sempre sulla tua pagina Facebook sono veramente meravigliosi. Va bene, il tempo a nostra disposizione per oggi termina qui. Ron, noi ti ringraziamo per il per le tue risposte, per la tua disponibilità. Da parte di Comics Reporter, Fumetto Mania e The Flyer Show, per oggi è tutto. Grazie e alla prossima. Ciao, Ron. Oh, thank you very much. Have a so, great Ron, day. Thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure to have some time to talk with you and we, we really appreciate your sketch on uh, your Facebook page. So really thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to spend some time with you. Well, today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, when, when Sit Comics start coming out this summer, I, I don't know what the distribution is going to be like, but uh, please try it out. Uh, of course. More information on my Facebook page and let me know what you think of it. Okay. We will. Perfect. Absolutely. It's thank great. you. Bye. Thank Cheers. you very much. Ciao. Grazie, Ron. Ciao. Bye-bye now.